All right, this is going to be part two. We're going to start with gastrointestinal regulation, and we're going to look at um, this slide. Just mentions the general, you know, principles of GI regulation. So regulation is not based on the hom concept of homeostasis. Um, so what that means is your gastrointestinal tract is going to absorb as many nutrients as possible. It does not matter if you need them or not. So your body doesn't say your your digestive tract doesn't say, hey, we had that you know huge meal last night, some sausage pizza, some beer. We don't need any calories today, so we're not going to absorb any. Uh, that's that's not <laughs> how it works. So we're going to just absorb nutrients. Um, as they come in and store them as fat. Um, the GI function is regulated to maximum absorption, right? Whether we need it or not. And conditions in the lumen of the GI tract are regulated to maximize absorption. So we didn't get to where we are by, you know, not absorbing food. Um, in terms of the, our evolutionary past, in order to survive because food was not readily accessible, right? We had to pack away and store all the calories that we encountered. So we still have that system, even though we have, you know, plenty of food at our fingertips. So the phases of um, digestion are called cephalic, gastric, and intestinal. And it's really simple. All it means is there's phases of um, sort of uh, the eating process or the, the whole digestive system works on what's coming in, the input that's going into your head. So that's the cephalic phase, which is, you know, you get excited when you see really good food, you smell food, you start to taste food, you even think about food. Those are all very um, real uh, inputs to your nervous system and your, your nervous system via the vagus nerve primarily, okay? The vagus nerve can actually come from your brain and start to stimulate um, motility and secretions from your gastrointestinal tract. Um, once the food hits your stomach, then we've entered the gastric phase, right? So we have contact, chemical contact, physical contact with the food, and these are gonna be um, triggering um, the motility then of your small intestine to sort of move the food through. So once your stomach feels food in it, it will, produce an enzyme um, called gastrin, and that enzyme is going to promote the emptying of your bowels because basically your stomach is like, okay, we're getting more food, it's another meal, all that stuff that's still in our small intestine or large intestine, let's get it out, let's push it out to make room for more food. So that's the, the gastric phase, and that's what basically the, the hormone gastrin does. And then once the food hits your intestines, then we're on the negative uh, sorry, then we're in the intestinal phase. And then actually this area, the intestines, it's going to slow down motility because your intestines are like, hey, we got food now. So now we have to sort of slow it down so we can start to digest chemically and also absorb, right? So it takes time to do that. So your intestines will actually make another hormone called secretin and secretin um, inhibits gastrin. Okay, so there's gonna be some kind of negative feedback there. So these are the hormones are going to be um, you're going to have to be familiar with for this exam, um, and I actually just type these guys out in your outline. Um, pretty much the same stuff here. I kind of didn't go into as much detail that they do in the book, but I put the the highlights of what you should know of each hormone. So let's just start talking about them. So gastrin, right? This is secreted by the stomach. And, you know, because the word gastro refers to stomach, so gastrin and stomach, that should be pretty easy to remember. And the cells that create them are called G cells, gastrin cells. G cells are going to secrete this hormone. And remember, so this is an endocrine gland, right? And the stimulus is going to be the proteins hitting the stomach and also the stretch of the stomach wall. So that's, you know, basically, hey, we, we have food now. And then it's going to stimulate the acids. All right, so the stimulus is proteins and distension or stretch. You can also get parasympathetic input. Um, so I'll mention this because this is that cephalic stage, right? If you're thinking about food, if you're kind of hungry anyway, and then you start to really think about food, you can your stomach will start to growl, or perhaps you're hungry and you uh, you see food or you can smell food, right? Your 
your stomach will start to really churn and start to work. And so that's that parasympathetic input. So action is going to stimulate your gastric secretions and motility, right? So it's going to start to secrete the acid. It's going to start to churn. You, when your stomach growls, that's the motility there, okay? Um, you, the stomach will have those waves of peristalsis. And remember that the stomach has three different layers of smooth muscle. So the, the stomach can actually kind of churn the food and, and mix it in different ways. And so if it's empty, but it's churning, you're gonna have those, the air in the stomach rolling around and making those sounds, the grumbling sounds. So that's an empty stomach getting ready for food. Gastrin also says, hey, rest of my, um, <laughs> hey, small intestine, hey, large intestine, I'm gonna get ready for food. So let's push everything out. So it's gonna stimulate um, mass movement of colon. This is when you have to go to the bathroom, when you, when you have to go number two, when you defecate, your large intestine has an event called a mass movement. So this is basically, you wanna, you know, it's pushing the food um, further on down the line. It's going to stimulate ileal motility. So that's small intestine motility, get that food out. <clears throat> and it's gonna relax the ileocecal, ileocecal sphincter. Remember this sphincter is between the ileum and the colon. So we want the food or the, you know, that basically it's not food anymore. It's just sort of the digested material that's almost all digested. Like there's nothing really else to pull out from it. That's in the ileum. And the ileum is right next to the very first part of the large intestine called the cecum. So ileocecal is that little valve, that little sphincter there, and then gastrin will relax it so that whatever's left in the ileum can move into the colon, the colon will have a mass movement and push everything basically towards the sigmoid colon. <clears throat> so that's gastrin. Cholecystokinin, CCK, is going to be, you can see the rest of these guys, these are the same, right? They're gonna be duodenum and jejunum, the first two portions of the small intestine. So CCK is primarily gonna to respond to fat, okay? Protein also, but pre predominantly fat. And the reason why I want you to think fat is because it will start to get bile um, into the duodenum. So remember that in your anatomy brain, you can picture the bile duct coming down from the bile travels from the liver. It can also travel from the gallbladder. So what CCK is going to do is it's going to <clears throat> st let me just stimulate bile secretion by the liver. It's also going to stimulate gallbladder contraction. All right. So those are the two bile sources. Remember, bile emulsifies fat, which is why I want you to think fat. And then it's also gonna relax that sphincter of OD. You guys may have also learned sphincter of OD as hepatopancreatic sphincter. Okay, because that's what our anatomy book had it as. I, I learned sphincter of OD. But that's that little tiny smooth muscle sphincter that's right there at the base of where the common bile duct and the pancreatic duct meet. And when it opens, it's gonna spill out both bile and pancreatic um, enzymes into the duodenum, okay? Now, <clears throat> fats are also acidic, fatty acids, right? So bicarbonate is gonna help secrete bicarbonate into the small intestine so it can neutralize the acids coming from the chyme. So that's actually really important. The, the chyme coming from your, your stomach is like a pH of two. And the stomach protects itself by a very thick mucus coating. And uh, your duodenum does not have that thick mucus coating. So the acids can burn the surface of your duodenum and cause duodenal ulcers. Um, but because you have the car sodium bicarbonate coming from the um, pancreas, it can neutralize that chyme. So the chyme is actually secreted in very small amounts, three to four milliliters, which is not very much, um, come into your duodenum at a time so it can get neutralized. <clears throat> what CCK also does, and all of the rest of them do, is inhibit gastric secretion and motility. Inhibit gastric secretion and motility. Inhibits gastric secretion and motility. Okay, so by the time your food gets to your intestines, your intestines say, okay, hold up, we need time. We need time to digest, we need time to absorb, so we're gonna slow down the gastric motility, the stomach, 
um, we'll slow everything down. So it's going to inhibit gastrin and slow down your gastric secretions and motility. So stop the stomach from working too much. Um, <clears throat> okay, so there we go. So the CCK will also stimulate the enzyme. So everything coming from the pancreas. All right, next hormone is secretin. And this is going to <clears throat> get stimulated by acids in the duodenum. And it's also going to help bicarbonate come out. Um, I didn't put down potentiate CCK, but that's because <clears throat> CCK overlaps with that role on the pancreas enzyme secretion, and it helps to stimulate bile by the liver. And then lastly, we have our glucose independent, oh, sorry, glucose dependent insulotropic hormone or peptide, sorry, GIP, um, and that's going to be in response. And it should make sense that an insulinotropic, so it's going to help insulin get secreted, will get stimulated by glucose, right? So it's going to um, both, we already talked about how it inhibits gastric secretion motility, but it's also going to stimulate insulin secretion by the pancreas. All right. So those are the hormones you want to get to know. <clears throat> and then we'll look at another. What's well, going to regulate our food intake? So yes, people eat when they're bored and there's a lot of emotional eating out there. Um, but outside of that, there's also just like the feeling of hunger and the feeling of being full. So we're just going to concentrate on, on that. So leptin is the hormone that's produced by the adipose tissue. So we'll look at this. Leptin from adipose tissue stimulates the release of two other things called alpha mash, or I call it MSH, but I say mash, <laughs> and CART. So the leptin goes to the brain, the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is your homeostatic mechanism area of the brain, right? So this is going to control hunger and it's going to control um, feeling full. So leptin, when it gets to your brain, um, it stimulates these other two factors from the hypothalamus itself. And those two factors are going to increase sympathetic activity and then stimulate. So <clears throat> let's just talk real quick about parasympathetic and sympathetic um, nervous system with your digestive tract. Your digestive system is rest and digest, right? So your digestive system will be active when the parasympathetic nerves are active. And the parasympathetic nerve is the vagus nerve. So if you, so that activeness, right, the opposite of that would be the sympathetic nerves. So if you are in the fight or flight mode, when the sympathetic fibers are active, it's going to slow down or stop the motility in the digestive system. Okay. So for this um, to feel full, it's going to actually activate the sympathetic fibers, right? Because you want to slow down um, the, the, the uh, GI tract. And what alpha mash and cart do is that, and they also help to stimulate um, thyroid stimulating hormone and ACTH, which is the um, tropic hormone for the um, cortisol. And both of those hormones are going to help to um, sort of use the energy that you just took in. Um, <clears throat> the opposite, oh, okay, so this is just satiety. Okay. So feeling full is leptin. Leptin acts on the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus will in return make two other molecules that will do two things. <clears throat> they're going to either activate the sympathetic pathway and they're going to activate two hormones, TSH and cortisol. ACTH, and those two hormones are going to increase metabolism in your body because your body knows that it just ate <clears throat> your fat or, you know, you should be feeling full. You should be feeling sated. Um, I don't have a picture for um, orexigenic factors, but in your notes, orexigenic factors will help you feel hungry. And the one that's listed is ghrelin. So ghrelin is a hormone. It's um, produced by your stomach and it makes you feel hungry. Um, so it's going to promote eating. It's going to decrease the metabolism. So look, if you're on a starvation diet and you feel hungry all the time, ghrelin is going to be present in higher amounts. It's going to 
it's going to make you seek food, right? Your body's like, why are we not eating? We're hungry. We're hungry. Let's get some food. So ghrelin will also decrease your metabolism. And this is why starvation diets, they say, don't work because what it does is it pushes your metabolism down. So the, the caloric, <clears throat> your BMR, the amount of calories you burn every day actually goes down. So it makes it harder to lose weight if you're on a starvation diet because, you know, ghrelin is one part of that. So ghrelin is going to increase your parasympathetic activity, right, to promote rest and digest. Ghrelin might make your stomach rumble. Um, and so it's going to stimulate your GI tract activity and it's going to inhibit TSH and ACTH. So it does the opposite of, of leptin. All right, now we're going to turn our attention to secretions. Um, saliva, the secretions of our stomach, the secretions of bile, and movement. Um, so I don't have a picture for you on the saliva, but it's listed in your outline. Same concept here with the parasympathetic and sympathetic activation. So your saliva can be controlled by the nervous system. If you're resting and digesting and you're not nervous, you have a more watery saliva. You're, when you're eating, you want the, the foods to dissolve in the water to make the bolus, but also to taste. Remember how the, the chemoreceptors of your tongue, the, the food actually has to be dissolved in water in order for those receptors to detect the different chemicals. Um, so that's necessary. So watery saliva is necessary for when you're eating. But if you're nervous, right, you have dry mouth. So there's a very viscous, you're, you're still producing saliva. It's just super, super dry. Um, and it's, it's not the same as when you're eating. So <clears throat> that's nervous system. And then your um, higher areas, right, the medulla and also the cortex, when you taste or you feel a texture of food in your mouth or the sight and smell of it or even thinking of it, right, that can start you salivating from the stomach. So now we have the stomach picture here. So gastric acid secretion. This is a review. I already mentioned this before, how the parietal cells will make hydrochloric acid <clears throat> and the chief cells are going to make the enzyme, but we're just talking about acid here. So the parietal cells are going to make acid. How? Here's the enzyme carbonic anhydrase again. Okay. Because HCl, if you just take a look at what's coming out, all we need is H and Cl, right? We just need hydrogen ions and we need chloride ions. And that's it. That would be um, hydrochloric acid. So we have carbonic anhydrase inside of these parietal cells, right? Here's the word parietal cell. And it's going to do what it does. <clears throat> it's going to make um, carbonic acid. The carbonic acid dehydrates, or sorry, dissociates, not dehydrates, dissociates, forms your hydrogen ion and it gets pumped out. And it's, it's, it's pumping out. You can see we're actually using energy to pump it out. For chloride, it's pumped in from the bloodstream and it just um, passively diffuses out. So that's basically it. So uh, let's see. Hydrogen ions are actively secreted by the pump. It's called a proton pump. This is the proton pump. It's, um, yeah, so it's known as the proton pump, you know, because it's using ATP. <clears throat> and since it's pumping out a positive um, hydrogen ion, it pumps in a positive potassium ion. And then this is just showing potassium leak. Um, bicarbonate is transported into the interstitial fluid with the antiporter of chloride. <clears throat> so here, as we make our bicarbonate, right, with our um, carbonic anhydrase equation, it's going to be an antiporter with chloride. So a negative for a negative, all right? Um, and then chloride, chloride just diffuses into the lumen of the stomach because it has a diffusion gradient. Um, so stomach around pH of two, very, very acidic. Um, <clears throat> what happens is as you eat, so you have this pH of two. As you eat, um, the acids, these hydrogen ions will start to bond, make bonds. It'll start to make bonds with the food, with the proteins. And as it's filling with food, your stomach acids get less and less acidic. They get more and more alkaline. So your pH can actually move up to about a pH of 5 if the stomach is full of food. And then when your stomach empties and the food is gone, the, the gastric juice is now a pH of 2 again. All right. So stimulation for secretion, what is it that prompts the acids to get secreted? <clears throat> cephalic phase, okay, again, just the, the, 
the food taste, the smell, chewing, swallowing, everything that acts on the vagus nerve is going to promote um, acid. Um, it's also going to promote gastrin. It's also going to promote pepsinogen, which is the enzyme that um, digests protein. Uh, the gastric phase, when it's in the stomach, when the food hits the stomach, it's going to help regulate gastrin. So the stimulus is going to be those proteins in the stomach and the stretch of the stomach, the distension of the stomach. All right. So this is a reflex. So once the food hits the stomach, there's a reflex. The, the brain is not involved. It's just a, a, something the stomach does that triggers gastrin and acid and pepsinogen. All right. What's going to inhibit the secretions is going to be two things. Somatostatin is made by D cells of the stomach and acts to inhibit gastrin. So it's just a local paracrine. <clears throat> Somatostatin is going to inhibit gastrin and then secretin. We talked about that one already. All right. So increased acidity is going to inhibit gastrin. That's a negative feedback in the stomach itself. And then food entry into the duodenum. That's also going to inhibit uh, a reflex that's going to inhibit um, acid and pepsinogen. All right, um, so let's look at our flow chart here. So we have the cephalic phase <clears throat> increasing parasympathetic activity. This is going to help gastrin get secreted from G cells, right? And then the parasympathetic activity could also just directly produce acid. So we have both acid and pepsinogen secreted. Once this is going to be the gastric phase, once we have proteins in the stomach is distension in the stomach, we have chemoreceptors in the stomach and mechanoreceptors in the stomach that can detect the proteins, right? This is a chemical. Distension is that baroreceptor, that stretch receptor, which is technically a mechanoreceptor. And then we're going to also you know, either increase gastrin or just increase acid and pepsinogen. So just flow charts on how, what, what's in your notes, nothing different. <clears throat> Four bicarbonates, are we here yet? Um, let's skip that one for now, this is the duodenum. Oh, so I don't have a picture of um, ulcers. Okay, I was looking for that. Just a quick, um, word on ulcers. <clears throat> so when you have a gastric ulcer, it's basically an open wound to the stomach lining. So um, let me just draw real quick for you, right? So this is the stomach lining. And then we're going to have um, mucus on top. So I'll just draw a, a big thick layer of mucus. And the cells, right, so I'll draw some cells of the stomach here. They should be columnar, actually. Okay, some cells. So the cells of the stomach are protected because they are hidden under this very, very thick layer of mucus. And there's a little tiny space, like there's a, an area right where the mucus meets the cells, where you have a neutral pH, okay? So the pH of your acid is a pH, stomach is pH of two, but in this little tiny, where I have my X's, this is gonna be neutral, pH of seven. <clears throat> now, ulcers are largely created by um, an infection with a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori. And Helicobacter pylori will come into your gastrointestinal, and come into your stomach through the saliva and they burrow and they live here in this space under the mucus next to your epithelial cells. And your immune system doesn't like this. And so your immune system is going to attack, your immune system is gonna attack those bacterial cells. Let's make this blue, right? You have an immune response. This is gonna be chronic because the immune response is not gonna get rid of these bacteria. The bacteria are gonna be there for a very long time. So this chronic immune response starts to eat away at the normal cells here. <clears throat> these cells are responsible for producing the mucus. So if you have destruction of these cells in a very specific area, you're also gonna have destruction of that mucus layer and you're going to have an area where it's open 
right? You don't have a lot of mucus protection. And then the acids of the stomach are going to be able to irritate the lining, the deeper linings of the stomach. And that's your ulcer. So an ulcer is kind of like an open wound <clears throat> of your stomach. Now, another cause is going to be um, taking ibuprofen or aspirin because these two can actually prevent the production of that, the mucus barrier. So um, if you take too much ibuprofen, sometimes it irritates people's stomach. Um, so you have to be careful about that. Uh, <clears throat> treatment for stomach ulcers would be taking um, something to raise the pH, right? Because if the pH, if you do have an ulcer, it's gonna hurt if the acid's being produced. So Tums, is an antacid and it's going to, it's basically bicarbonate. And so it's going to um, raise the pH of your stomach so it won't be so acidic. There's also something called a proton pump inhibitor and that goes under the brain, uh, brand names Nexium or Prilosec. And that's a proton pump inhibitor. So let's go back, right? So that's a, this is the proton pump. It'll stop that. So, which means that, that you won't get the hydrogen ions Chloride, who cares? This doesn't tr contribute to pH. It's the free hydrogen ions. Um, and so if you stop the proton pump, you're not going to get that acid in the stomach. Okay, so <clears throat> those are the two um, treatments for gastric ulcers. All right, let's look at gastric motility. Okay, so why don't we, let's see. So these are flow charts that I, of things I've talked about before, so I'm not going to go over these. Um, I think you can just sort of follow it. And yeah, these are things I talked about before in the secretions. So let's move on to motility. So motility is going to be um, regulated. And uh, what motility really means is what the walls of the GI tract are doing, right? And this is going to be smooth muscle, right? And it's primarily due to the muscularis externa. <clears throat> Remember the muscularis externa, there's an outer longitudinal and an inner circular layer. And in the intestines and the stomach, we have mixing, um, which is called segmentation. And we also have to move the food through, and that's called peristalsis, to propel the food from point A to point B, this is peristalsis, to mix the food is called segmentation. Let's just take a look at those two. <clears throat> so peristalsis is going to be this um, moving of the bolus or, uh, or chyme or whatever the material is through the, through the um, whole GI tract. Peristalsis begins at the esophagus. All right, and then ends in the colon. So the complete GI tract is, you know, you're moving the material through through peristalsis. Segmentation is a mixing. So we want to like move back and forth um, the bolus or the, not the bolus, excuse me, the, um, the material in the small intestine is going to get segmented. What segmentation helps to provide is <clears throat> when we say mix, like that's, yes, it is mixing, but why? because we want to allow the enzymes to get exposed. We want the, the food that, that to get exposed to all the enzymes on the brush border, right? So we want enzymes to be, to get exposed to the food, or I guess maybe it should be said the opposite. It should be food exposed to the enzymes. So it's, Anyway, so you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> we want the food to get exposed. So to the enzymes on the brush border. And not only that, but we want to also absorb the food. So if you had kind of like a solid sphere of food coming through your small intestine, all those internal nutrients in that ball are gonna stay internal. But if you segment and you start to mix, then they're going to sort of, you know, move it all around and you can expose the surfaces. So it's a, a way to maximize, again, nutrient absorption. Mm, let's talk about the waves here now. All right. 
So what's happening here is that um, you have kind of like the heart pacemaker cells. You have pacemaker cells in the small intestine <clears throat> and in the, in the stomach. Um, and they're going to create something called slow waves. Slow waves are these depolarizations that do not reach thre threshold, but they are present because you have these pacemaker cells. So it's kind of just like the pacemaker of the heart. You have an unstable resting potential. And not all the slow waves will make an action potential. However, sometimes when you get a slow wave and it's big enough that it reaches threshold, okay, like right here, we see an action potential. When you have an action potential, you have contraction. You see, so this is muscle tension. This is contraction. This is just potential. This is just what's happening electrically in the smooth muscle wall. So one baby threshold, just hit threshold. We have one action potential. We have one very mild, small contraction. We go a little bit above threshold. We have three action potentials. What does that do? You can see we have a little stronger contraction. We go way above threshold. We have many more action potentials as we remain above threshold, right? Because these are slow. Slow means that there's, they're going to uh, reach threshold, stay above threshold, and then come down slow, okay? So the, the more you overshoot threshold, the longer you'll stay there, and the more action potentials will be generated, giving you an even stronger contraction. So this is how your intestines work, okay? Your <clears throat> stomach actually has, um, slow waves actually cause contraction. So in the stomach, these guys cause a contraction. However, in the stomach, when you create an action potential, it creates a stronger contraction. More action potentials, even stronger contraction. So the stomach, the slow waves do make a contraction, but the intestines is this picture that we talked about initially. The intestines, we always have the slow waves. When they reach threshold, depending on how far it overshoots and depending on how many action potentials are produced, you can have various um, strengths of contraction. Okay, so what's going to regulate our slow waves? <clears throat> the autonomic nervous system and hormones. Okay, so the parasympathetic, remember this is rest and digest. It's going to get it going faster, you get faster contractions, more powerful contractions. Sympathetic activation will slow it down, will hyperpolarize those cells. They're not going to reach action potential quickly and it's going to slow down those um, slow waves even slower. Um, <clears throat> okay, I think that's it. So the stomach we talked about, the intestines, action potentials required for force. The strength of contraction varies with the frequency of action potentials. Okay, I covered that. We, we talked about peristalsis and segmentation already. Let's move on to chewing and swallowing. All right, fun gif of someone swallowing, really fun. <laughs> so um, chewing, it, there's a reflex in chewing that you can read about if you want. I'm not gonna have you guys memorize it for the exam. Swallowing, there's also a reflex in swallowing, and I do write it out. I think this is just gonna be repeat of anatomy, so just remember that you're going to push the bolus of food to the back of your, um, your pharynx, and it's going to, um, the tongue is gonna do that. As the bolus of food descends, as it comes down your pharynx, all right, it's gonna hit your epiglottis. The epiglottis is gonna go down and cover your glottis so the food doesn't enter into your trachea. You can actually see this epiglottis right there. Anyways, so we, um, now the bolus is gonna enter into the esophagus and the up, there's an upper esophageal sphincter in this, this little area here an upper esophageal sphincter that has to open to accept the bolus, and then right afterwards it closes. And then as the bolus is moving via peristalsis down the esophagus, right, it's gonna go through peristalsis, it's, <clears throat> this reflex is gonna open up that lower esophageal sphincter, allow the bolus to come in, and then close afterwards. Okay. Um... Oh, and swallowing also um, affects the stomach. So the stomach itself, the, the wall of the stomach will actually start to relax so it can accept the food. All right, and then here's our, our picture of swallowing. So <clears throat> our bolus 
the epiglottis, and then our location of the upper esophageal sphincter. Um, all right, then let's talk about motility. Except my next slide is on vomiting. Okay, so gastric motility. This is kind of um, just review. So motility is for mixing chyme. Oops, the chyme is misspelled in the outline. Regulate gastric emptying, regulated by the um, enteric nervous system. <clears throat> okay, um, the pyloric sphincter is closed while mixing the chyme, but stronger contractions will open the sphincter. And the chyme moves slowly into the duodenum because it's very acidic. So I said this earlier, only three to four mils come in at a time. Um, what regulates the gastric motility? Again, review gastrin, distension of the stomach, and then come, turn to find out anger and aggression also increases motility. And then what decreases the motility in the force of your stomach is CCK, secretin, and GIP, those other three. Pain, fear, and depression also de de depresses the uh, motility. And also distension of the duodenum. So when, when the duodenum feels full, when it gets stretched, then it's going to um, stop the motility of the stomach. Um, <clears throat> vomiting, which is what we have here, the stimulus for vomiting can come from many areas. Um, it can come from, you know, drugs, chemicals, or toxins entering into our body. It can come from food poisoning or chemotherapy. It can come from um, basically emotions, right? Any emotions, pain, anticipation, a smell can cause vomiting. So vomiting, there's all different kinds of mechanisms involved here. Um, but vomiting is basically just a really large uh, pressure created by the abdominal, like the, the um, intra-abdominal pressure. And this is created by abdominal muscles. Um, it's created by your breath. So um, the lower esophageal sphincter is going to relax. And as your abdominal muscles contract, it pushes the food, of course, out your mouth. Um, and so it's not something called a reverse peristalsis. And yes, that... Um, pyloric sphincter can also open so if it's strong enough you can actually do, you can vomit substances that have gone into your duodenum and if the bile had already gone to your duodenum you might have green um, vomitus because that bile is green so um yeah that's that's vomiting so you can see in this slide i just picked it up from um, a website but you can see that there's these are the treatments for the nausea or the vomiting Okay, so I'm not going to go into that, but you might want to read those um, if you know, if you have ever had issues with vomiting. <clears throat> All right, so motility of the small intestine um, should make sense. We have regulation of motility. If it's distended, if you have a stretched small intestine, it's going to increase the motility. Um, autonomic nervous system should make sense. Hormones should make sense. Um, we have some reflexes of the um, small intestine. So if there's injury or severe stress, that's going to inhibit your intestinal contractions, and that should make sense. So that's called an intestino-intestinal reflex, just within the intestine. Um, the iliogastric is some kind of distension in the ileum, so the ileum is full, and that's going to inhibit gastric motility. Um, and that should also make sense because when the il that we were talking about all the time, like the small intestine, when it feels food, um, it's going to slow down the stomach. And then the gastroileal reflex is the presence of chyme in the stomach will increase motility in the ileum. And this should make sense too, because we were talking about how when the stomach gets food, it tells the rest of your intestines to hurry up and push things out. Motility of the colon. So we have a picture of the colon here, and we can see that, you know, start if you want to do a quick review, here's your cecum, the ascending colon. We have our transverse colon, which looks quite not like a, uh, a nice picture in a textbook. And then we have the, uh, the descending colon, and then we have our sigmoid colon at the end here. So the sigmoid colon should, I lost it now. Anyways, <clears throat> haustrations are like segmentation, but slower. And so we, we call the movements here haustrations, and then again, mass movements. So we talked about mass movements. So you have one to three mass movements a day, <clears throat> you know, this is just average, some people more, some people less. And um, regulation of what moves the colon 
is going to be two reflexes. Distension of the colon, so stretch of the wall is going to cause relaxation <clears throat> of the wall and um, in other areas of the colon. So colono, colonic reflex uh, is going to re relax the colon. And the gastrocolic reflex, food in the stomach, will increase colonic motility. Um, the reason why when you have stretch in the colon will relax the colon is because you want to reabsorb that water. You want time to reabsorb the water. And then we have defecation, which is going to be um, both voluntary and involuntarily controlled. Um, distension of the colon will activate the stretch receptors there. And, <clears throat> you know, so when you have stretch in the sigmoid colon, that tells your, your brain it's, you know, we're, we need to go to the bathroom. Um, Parasaltic contractions of the sigmoid colon will propel more fecal matter into the rectum, and that will increase the pressure in the rectum, right? And the internal anal sphincter will relax, and the external anal sphincter is voluntary, but we need to relax that. And of course, both sphincters relax to achieve defecation. And that is it. So we are moving on to our review questions. Which of the following is not a type of receptor that's located within the wall of the GI tract and involved in regulation and GI function? So the answer is no susceptor. So in the wall of our GI tract, we have osmoreceptors, chemoreceptors, and mechanoreceptors. This is going to be largely those stretch bare receptors, but we do not have pain receptors. So when you feel pain, that is probably either due to an osmo or mechanoreceptor, um, that extra stretch. Um, so if you eat so much that you're in pain, you just maxed out your mechanoreceptor there. Which of the following function uh, as a stimulus for the secretion of CCK? Okay, the answer is B. Which of the following substances inhibits gastric secretion and motility, stimulates bile and pancreatic bicarbonate secretion? Okay, so this is going to inhibit secretion and motility, stimulate bile, and pancreatic bicarbonate. So it's not going to be trypsin. It's not going to be this one. So is it gastrin or secretin? So gastrin is going to stimulate gastric motility, and secretin is going to inhibit. Which of the following substances acts on the appetite control center of the hypothalamus to reduce the sensation of hunger? And that is going to be letter C, leptin. Which enzyme catalyzes a reaction inside parietal cells that generates acid secretion in the stomach? The answer is B, carbonic anhydrase. Severe distension or injury to any portion of the small intestine inhibits contractile activity through the rest of the intestine. This is achieved through which of the following reflexes? <clears throat> this is going to be letter B, intestino-intestinal reflex. Which of the following is not one of the zymogens secreted by the pancreas into the duodenum? So this one's going to be pepsinogen. Pepsinogen is secreted by the stomach. And that is it.